This program is made possible by Cardinal Health and is a co-production of The Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and WOSU Public Media. This is a complicated issue, and I think um, it's one of those issues where you might say it takes a village to make a difference. We have a wonderful village here. We are looking to extend that not only in central Ohio and Ohio, but throughout the country, and I, I really believe it's possible to get the word out about the scope and the depth of this issue to encourage all to learn more, to know more, to do something about it, and, and to truly make a difference. We have a great panel here this afternoon, so without any more comments, I'm going to turn it back to Ty. Please start thinking of ways and questions that you might want to ask. We have an incredibly exciting panel. I think it's why most of you have turned out here, and uh, 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 Director Cornelius Dawson's already laughing at me. Um, uh, starting in the middle, uh, Director uh, George Meyer, he is the, um, uh, the chair for the Ohio Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. He's also the Assistant Director for the Ohio Department of Public Safety. To his right is Alvin Jackson, the Vice Chair of the Ohio Pre Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force and the uh, Director of the Ohio Department of Health. Um, to Director Meyer's left is uh, Director Angela Cornelius Dawson. She is uh, the Director of the Ohio Department of Alcohol and Drug Addiction Services. Uh, we also have um, Dr. George Ann Diniaco over here. Uh, she is with Saving Drug Free Schools Coordinator for Dublin City Schools. Um, Kenneth Hale, who is uh, the Assistant Dean at the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy. Uh, and then we have Lisa Roberts, uh, Public Health Nurse, Portsmouth Department of Health and Jessica Trickett, Outpatient Counselor, Amethyst Incorporated. So uh, it's a great panel, really excited. We're going to hear from them. What I'm going to do today is we're going to start with questions specifically for them. Uh, instead of doing opening comments, they're going to go ahead and answer the opening questions. Then we're going to open it up for a question and answer. You have been given a card. You guys have seen at least one card, maybe two, uh, at your seats. Um, and we want you, as the proceedings are going on, go ahead and write down whatever question you may have. Make sure to put your name and your town on there, and if you have who you want the question uh, specifically to, uh, to be addressed to. When you have it, raise it up, and we have people from the um, uh, Drug Free Action Alliance that will come and pick those up, and the, the School of Pharmacy from Ohio State that will pick up the questions. We will look at the questions in the back and then hand them to Diane at the microphone right here, and she will ask your questions um, to the, the panelists. Uh, the big part of this is we want to hear the opening, but we really want to hear from you guys, want to know the questions you have, and that's what's really going to drive uh, uh, how we work together and how we all learn um, together today. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Jessica, if you don't mind, Jessica Trigo. Why are people abusing prescription drugs? Well, I think the answer to that question, I think there's a several different reasons why. Um, as a previous uh, as a person recovering from prescription drug abuse addiction, um, I think that they're fairly easy to obtain um, through the doctors. And then I think that what happens is it's very easy to justify using prescription drugs because it was prescribed by a doctor. So that's something that I've seen also as an outpatient counselor. Um, a lot of people feel like, well, it's prescribed by a doctor, so it's safe. So I think there's this um, false idea that it's safe and then it's okay to use them. And even, in, even when people are using them recreationally, um, I think that, that that's a big reason why a big uh, justification factor is that they, they feel like it's a prescription drug so it's safer and um, not as much harm can happen to um, the individual because it's prescribed and it's been tested on people instead of some street drugs that you, know, you might not know what you're getting. There's this false idea that you know what you're getting because it's a prescription drug. Thank you. Uh, Director Jackson. Is the uh, situation in Ohio relating to prescription drug abuse and drug poisoning death typical of other states? Um, yes, it is. Um, this problem is occurring all across America. However, in Ohio, we are seeing a higher than the national average in terms of deaths as well as the availability of these prescription medications. We truly, truly have an epidemic going on in this country and in Ohio. Let me give you a perspective here. In 1999, there were 2.9 deaths per 100,000 in Ohio compared to the national average of four per 100,000. By 2006, 
these numbers had risen to 11.1 per 100,000 in Ohio, with a national average about 8.8. And by 2008, at least 13 deaths per 100,000. So we see we have a huge and shocking statistic as it relates to this evolving epidemic. Additionally, when we reflect on the cost, it's costing our society billions of dollars. In fact, we spend $3.5 billion yearly in Ohio as it relates to these deaths, time away from work, and many of the quality of life issues that this engenders. Additionally, we spend $31.9 million yearly in terms of hospitalization. Not only that, we are very shocked by what we're seeing in our high schools as about four out of the five uh, medications or prescription drugs that high school students use are related to prescriptions and non-prescription use. So this is having a huge impact on our high school students. And at least a quarter of high school students indicate that they use prescription medication that was not prescribed for them. So this problem truly is of epidemic proportion. It truly is incumbent upon us to create the awareness so that we can look to provide solutions. I, if I could follow up with that, I, I was curious. I've been working in the prevention arena for a long time here in the state. I, I've always thought of us as state, our state as leaders in the nation in, the, in that arena, and always been very proud of that. Brag about it when you go to other communities or other states. They recognize that Ohio is doing some great things. How did we get here? You know, I mean, underage drinking we've always gone after. The other, the other, uh, you know, street drugs we've we've been attacking for a long time. How do we just wake up and those numbers you just said are staggering? How do we get to that? They are in, in, in very staggering. In the 90s, there was this push in Ohio and in America to focus on the consumer's wants and needs. And there were a lot of television advertising and what we call direct marketing to consumers. And so because of that, it created more direct access to these medications uh, to the consumer as a whole. Also, we were very interested in, particularly those patients who needed pain, to look at different approaches in terms of how we treat pain as a whole. And because there was more pain medication available, and because there was diversion the of those pain medications sometime at home, they're not put in safe places, they get out in the marketplace. And naturally, a lot of patients became addicted through the regular clinical process. And because of this driven demand, many of these medication, because on the street, they will sell for 10 times what they will sell for in the pharmacy. For example, let's take OxyContin. If you were to take 100 pills of OxyContin, 80 milligrams, Roughly at the pharmacist, that will cost you $700 to $800. On the street, it's worth $7,000 to $8,000. So therefore, that undercurrent market was a driver also to get these medications to those who were addicted to them and as also part of the economic system. And we saw the rise and growth of pill mills, which were not legitimate marketplace for the deliverers of these medications. Now, you may ask me, what is a pill mill? Well, a pill mill usually are those mills who say, we're going to only accept cash. They don't always require physical examination. They treat pain with pills only. Sometimes you see large crowds hanging around. You may see security guards in place. Now, we will argue that it is appropriately to treat pain appropriately. But when we see the rise of pill mills, which we do not think is a good thing, we think that we have some challenges to address. So because of all these factors, we have seen a rise in the availability of pills, which has fueled this epidemic. Thank you. Uh, Director Meyer, what changes are needed in law enforcement and in our court systems uh, to begin to make an impact here? 
Well, thanks, Ty. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk about this issue. <clears throat> As you know, it's a very passionate issue that we're dealing with in our state and across the country, as Dr. Jackson mentioned. I'd first like to applaud Governor Strickland for uh, appointing me and the folks that we have on our Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. Uh, early spring, I think the governor, in my conversations with him on a couple occasions, um, really demonstrated a, a passion and a concern for this problem in our state. Um, he, he approached Dr. Jackson and I and asked us to uh, lead this group into coming up with some uh, recommendations for solutions which we have been working on since April and hopefully uh, first of October we'll be releasing a report for the governors that we can have some future steps. But as it relates to law enforcement and you know, falling on my background in law enforcement with uh, uh, nearly 30 years in law enforcement, um, uh, nearly 25 years in the Ohio State Highway Patrol, I've been able to reach out to some of my colleagues in law enforcement and to, to try to really get down to the, in the weeds and see just what the problem is that we're facing in law enforcement and what's the tools we need to address the problems that we're facing. And um, it's, it's easy enough really to pick up the newspaper or some media uh, each day and, and see another case that we're, that's involving you know, some type of uh, prescription drug abuse in our communities. And so uh, when we talk about law enforcement, one of the things that I would like to talk about is the things that we were able to do immediately. And one of the things that uh, I'm very proud of that we were able to do immediately was to uh, identify a, a criminal justice grant for the amount of $250,000. And we were able to take that grant because what we were hearing from our law enforcement partners was a couple things. One, our courts are being inundated with these types of cases. And two, our officers in the, in the field, first line officers, um, based on budget constraints and other issues that they deal with, just really didn't have the resources to deal with some of these cases. So uh, by identifying this grant, uh, we, we established through the Criminal Justice Services in the Department of Public Safety, we were able to reach out to our law enforcement partners, ask them to prepare a plan uh, of um, investigation, investigative plan that we were able to approve funding for. And so we were able to assist uh, nearly 25 agencies in, in conducting these, these sometimes difficult and uh, time-consuming investigations that really draw upon their resources. So that's one thing we were able to do and we'd like to keep that going. Another thing we were able to do is we're, we're reaching out and trying to develop some partnerships, uh, partnerships on the state, local, and federal level. So um, a, s a stronger collaboration with these partners to identify um, the folks, as Dr. Jackson mentioned, maybe the the people who are not legitimately running a pain clinic and um, certainly uh, investigate and prosecute those who are not doing things properly. Um, we were able to, in, in, in our criminal justice section, we're working on establishing a website for law enforcement. And it's basically a, a resource website. It will have information for law enforcement officers how to utilize our OR system, which is a prescription, prescription drug monitoring program in Ohio. Uh, how, how to better utilize that for their investigations, um, how to uh, find additional resources if they don't have the resources at their fingertips, um, uh, identify grants that may be available for law enforcement. So we're, we're in the planning stages and development stages of this website that will be very useful to law enforcement. And it might even be as something as simple as just identifying um, a law enforcement contact somewhere in the state of Ohio or maybe in the country that's dealt with this problem in the past and can assist law enforcement in uh, their, their, um, their effort to do a proper and successful investigation. Some of the other things we were able to do is we're reaching out to our federal partners um, and we're asking them to assist us in, in doing some mapping and their help in funding to fund some mapping of um, actually identifying some of our target areas or hot spots where we see prescription drug abuse uh, taking place we see the couriers of prescription drugs uh, coming across our state, certain routes that we see prescription drugs coming out of other states um, and uh, coming into Ohio and being diverted uh, illegally. So, um, you know, there are a number of projects that we are con currently working on, um, but I think that more importantly, uh, our, our Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force has been looking very closely at a number of areas, one of them being law enforcement initiatives. And so we have a work group that's been working on law enforcement initiatives that 
I think it's going to be a very exciting report for folks to read. One of the things that really impresses me about being part of that task force is the passion of the folks that are involved, and I, I applaud the people that are on the task force along with me, myself, and Dr. Jackson and Director Cornelius Dawson uh, being on the task force. The folks are very passionate about the work that we've been doing over the last uh, several months to try to bring, bring some resolution to this problem. And uh, the problem, as Dr. Jackson mentioned, is, is not just in Ohio. This problem is, uh, spreads across our country. So when we address this problem, it's a multi-level problem that we need to address, uh, not just from law enforcement, but from other areas as well, working together with law enforcement and, and the other areas to, to find the solution to the problem. And uh, I think one of the other things that we have been uh, very busy with is to recognize that this is um, not a problem that faces just Ohio. So when we, if we start to fix this problem here in the state of Ohio, what's the outcome of that? Um, how do we, what's the effect of bordering states? And so we're looking beyond the borders of Ohio and when we address uh, some of the solutions that we'll have for the problem. So in, in addition to that, you know, I think that um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, I think law enforcement has a lot of work ahead of us, but I think that we have the right people in place to, to work through the problem. Thanks. Uh, Director Cornelius Dawson, uh, what changes are needed in terms of addiction treatment and uh, recovery services? Uh, if you'd like to address this. Certainly. And again, thank you, Ty, and thank you to all of you who have taken time out of your day and been with this process throughout this day. It shows your passion and commitment to what we know has to happen. This month is Recovery Month nationally. This is a time of year where across this nation we are bringing to public awareness the societal benefits of treatment. So September marks National Alcohol and Drug Recovery Month. And so this event is timely. One of the things that was interesting in the opening uh, is that it absolutely will take a village. And we know that in our task force that we have a village assembled and we know that there is a village here today. In the Maasai tradition uh, in West Africa, the greeting every day is not, how are you doing? It is, how are the children? Because they greet each other that way because they want to know the status of the health of the children. And the children always reflect our well-being. And when we look at the issue of prescription drug abuse, and Dr. Jackson shared statistics with you earlier in his comments, when we have nearly half of our young people who access non-medical use of prescription drugs, identifying that they are receiving those from a family member or a relative or a friend, when four out of five of our young people are getting high from the first time using prescription drug abuse. How are the children? And so when we talk about what has to happen in the area of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, we would look specifically at the need for access. Access is critical. Access to treatment services, access to prevention services, and access to recovery support services. It is absolutely key that treatment slots are made available. None of us want our children suffering without means to mend and to heal. And part of our acknowledgement is that in order to deal with this issue, we have to make a way for people to have true access to the services that we need. We know that when we look at our existing public health system, we can only serve one in 10 of the individuals that are identified. So increased treatment access must be a priority. Increased public awareness. We know every day that we encounter individuals within our own family. Think about your last family reunion when you said, oh, I don't feel well. Someone's probably said, I've got something that I can give you. We have got to do a strategic marketing campaign that says it is not okay to share, trade, or exchange our prescription medication. And we have to do that from a broad-based approach. 
Children are not too young to learn about this issue. And so we have to see that within the elementary, middle school, high school, and college level. We have to change our attitude about our medication. We have to participate in events like prescription drug abuse take backs. We have to recognize that we need to not allow medications that are unused to remain in our homes because that is how they can be unintentionally diverted. We know that when it comes to cross-system collaboration, there's a significant amount of improvement that is needed. We have to work better from our public treatment system to our professional health care arena. We have to increase our ability to provide cross referrals so that individuals who are identified in the health sector as potentially needing addiction services can be referred. And that referral process must work in exchange with one another. In addition, we have to increase the level of education amongst healthcare and community service professionals. Do we really know those of us who are honored enough to touch people when they are hurting in any arena, in any aspect, do we know enough about addiction to identify the signs and symptoms and question whether or not that person could benefit from a referral? We all know that prevention is worth a pound of cure. Just one ounce will make a difference. That is clear in this issue. What we have to do is be diligent on this issue from all fronts. As a State Department, I have to be conscientious about what levels of deregulation that I can put in place so that I am not in the way of progress. We have to work together. It takes a village. How are the children? I'm sorry, I get lost. I just wanted you to keep listening. <laughs> you guys all want to go out and get to work now. I can see it. We're all fired up. Uh, and Director Myers talking about the, the passion of the people on the task force. Whenever you have uh, Dr. K or Director Cornelius Dawson on your task force, you got some passion. And Kenneth Hill, you get to follow that. Um, <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> go get them. Go get them. All right. Uh, we seem to think of prescription drugs um, and medication simply as a commodity in our society. How do you think this has uh, contributed to, to the prescription drug problem? Thank you, and, and also thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's, it's a real pleasure and honor to be among this panel. Uh, I, Talia, I think this is an incredibly important question. And as I think about the work we do at the College of Pharmacy at Ohio State, this question, I think, is kind of fundamental to this whole phenomenon. Uh, I think about um, some of the things that have been said by this panel already. Did you know you'll go home tonight and turn on the television and see drug ads and you may or may not know that there are only two developed countries in the world that allow that to happen, the New Zealand and the United States of America. So uh, we believe in our work that this has become a drug-taking culture. Uh, this has become normalized in our society. We will fill about 4 billion prescriptions this year. That means about 12 to 13 for everybody in the country. Uh, we expect quick fixes. Uh, we, we have access, we see them on television. Uh, there's a phenomenon that we use in our work uh, called pharmaceutical populism. It's a phrase uh, coined by Greg Kritzer in a book called Generation Rx. It says we're a growing culture of self-diagnosis and self-prescribing. Uh, we use some, some kind of catchy phrases in our works, things like you know, we're forgetting that there's a reason for the prescription. You know, we share, we see things on television, we get access to information on the internet, uh, you know, we're trying to help each other, as you said, at our family reunions. I mean, this is a common phenomenon. Uh, we, we, we use another phrase in our work called when sharing isn't caring. We, gotta, we have got, as uh, Director Cornelius Dawson says, we have got to do a better job of educating the public about there's a reason for the prescription, sharing isn't caring, that these drugs can certainly help us. You know, we're living longer and healthier lives than we have in any generation prior. But any drug, even if taken appropriately, has a downside. And when we start misusing and abusing, that escalates quite quickly. Uh, so, you know, we, we think that this uh, perhaps a different kind of drug abuse. I, I hate to say that phrase among uh, some of the people here with us today. But some people don't think of this as drug abuse. This is using medications. They are legal. They are perceived to be safe. They are sometimes thought to be non-addictive. Uh, and it, it's not considered to be drug abuse. And finally... You know, I look on our campus, I work at Ohio State University, we did a survey recently of student activity in this arena. 
And when you look at the top reasons that our young people are abusing these products, it isn't what my generation might would have answered those questions. It's not a really about getting high. I mean, that's on the list. But the top reasons are, I have pain, I have stress, I need to manage my life, I need to get to sleep, I need to wake up, I need to study. It's self-diagnosing and self-prescribing. So I think fundamentally, we've got to get back to understanding that there's a place for these medications, but if they're misused or abused, there is a pain. Uh, and if we can start to uh, drive that educational prevention me message harder, we'll be better off for it. Great. Thanks. Uh, Lisa, uh, what changes are needed? Lisa Roberts, uh, public health nurse. What changes are needed in our communities? We've, we've talked a lot about you know, some statewide things and how we got to this point. What changes are needed in the, the communities to begin to make an impact? Um, okay, well, Ty, I'll just talk a little bit about what I know and what's happened in my community, um, which is probably why I was invited to come here and speak. Um, I'm from Scioto County. Um, our uh, city is Portsmouth. And um, in Scioto County, over the course of the past year, um, we've seen some major changes as far as community involvement goes. Um, and in fact, we've managed to turn a community's attitude around from a sit back and watch and take it to uh, we'll get up and do something about it and fight back. Um, some of you may know Saida County and Portsmouth have, been, um, have received a lot of national attention recently um, as being the home of a lot of those illegitimate uh, pain clinics or pill mills that Dr. Jackson referred to. In fact, um, we have the highest concentration of them um, per capita in the entire state of Ohio. And, um, and we've been home to them for a long time. This isn't anything new um, except that they've multiplied um, in mass and they just keep coming. Um, and so I would say that the first step is to analyze what your problem is and um, to, de to determine, you know, what it is. Uh, your problem may be different than ours. We were able to determine through um, statistics that we had the second highest um, overdose death rate in the entire state. Um, we had the highest hepatitis C rate in the entire state. Um, in fact, it had quadrupled in just a five-year period. It was being driven by um, IV drug use, mainly opiates. Um, we also were, were able to determine that we were in the top 10 um, counties in the nation for illegal prescription drug trafficking and that um, three out of four of the people who overdosed and died in our county um, did not have a prescription for the medication that killed them, which um, lent a lot of credibility to the uh, problem of diversion, which is when someone you know sells their pills or gives their pills to someone else. So, um, with armed with those statistics, we were able to um, <clears throat> to kind of mobilize um, a coalition, and then that coalition was able to mobilize the community. So, I'd say your first step is to analyze your data and figure out what your problem is, and then tell everybody, tell, make it well known that you have a problem, especially um, your county residents. Um, because chances are they already know that you have a problem. Um, everybody's just kind of individually talking about the problem, but nobody's really gotten together and decided, well, we want to do something about the problem. Um, and so what we did is we identified a credible spokesman um, to carry this message. And in Scioto County, uh, our coroner was the perfect guy to do this because we were dealing with high death rates. Um, and we also um, had the public health, our, our health commissioner, um, Dr. Adams, um, and he declared a public health emergency in Scioto County, um, which lent a lot of credibility to the problem. And so um, those were the first steps. And then next you have to educate the people of the community. Um, and you have to let them know just exactly what's going on so that they, um, they can understand, you know, the mechanisms of the problem and um, can help be a part of the solution. So we actually did a series in the local newspaper and we called it um, World of Hurt. And we said, you know, we're in a great big world of hurt. Uh, and we laid out the crime statistics, uh, the addiction statistics, uh, the fact that 10% of our infants were now being born opiate addicted, um, the death rates, the hepatitis C, the social disruption, and everything that was going along with the problem. Um, we also identified that we had um, very, very high distribution rates um, of prescription medications, primarily opiates, um, and that um, that certainly coincided with the fact that we had nine um, pain clinics, um, half of which were owned by convicted um, felons. And um, <clears throat> so, um, and what went on in those places was anything but legitimate medica medicine. And it was very obvious to anybody who paid attention to the newspaper because um, people would be arrested right outside the clinics, um, selling their drugs on the street, um, and would be going back and forth 
inside the clinic as they carried on their business. And so, um, so we decided that we were going to take our community back. And so um, we did a series of town halls, very much like this one, although um, ours were certainly probably a little rowdier than what we have here because <laughs> we had some very angry people. Um, they were tired of this. Everybody had somebody in the family that was addicted. Everybody had been a victim of this in some way. And so they came with a lot of passion. And so um, we ended up doing three town halls and each one got consecutively bigger. Um, and we educated the people and we told them the ugly truth about what was going on within their county. Um, and so uh, we, we called that phase, we're going to clean our own house. And so um, a citizens group developed a petition, and the petition collected over 3,000 signatures. Um, the petition was delivered to um, the governor, and, um, and he, he responded. He, uh, he responded by creating the state task force. He actually made a trip to Portsmouth the day of the executive order. And, um, and then we organized a local task force. And local task force was um, made up of a broad range of people from various professions, just like you're seeing at this table today. Um, and these were stakeholders that all were being affected by the problem and all had important um, ideas that could help to fix it. Um, so we brought together law enforcement because we knew that we had a big legal, a, le a big illegal problem going on. We brought together public health because we were in a public health emergency. We brought the he together health care providers, addiction treatment uh, facility, and um, also city and county government um, were part of that core group. And we still exist today. Um, we're called the Soda County Action Team and we meet monthly and we're a very active group. Um, but then we needed a way to communicate with the citizens and let the citizens get involved because, uh, you know, we just couldn't have, you know, all the citizens um, as part of the meeting because they're just so varied in what they, what they can do and what they know. Um, and so thanks to, you know, the Internet and social networking, um, that's easy to accomplish today. Um, we actually did it through a Facebook group. And um, how many of you guys are on Facebook? So, you know, Facebook, you know, I was not on it, but I learned, and it's really easy. And um, so we have a Facebook group called Fix the Soda County Problem of Drug Abuse, Misuse, and Overdose, and it has just taken off. And you guys who know about Facebook, it's interactive. You can make comments. You can use it to educate. You can advertise your, uh, your events. Um, and we have over 3,700 members now on our Facebook group, and um, we've used it to educate the community about the problem. Um, every time we have a victory um, or a success or the governor's task force releases a report, we, we keep the public informed in that way. Um, we've actually used it to organize community events such as protests. Um, the we have Pill Mill Farewell Tour 2010 going on right now, and um, we've had 10 um, protests um, that have taken place in in every part of the community. Some are outside pain clinics, some are just part of the community to get all of the community involved. And so it's not unusual to see a large group of people out there with signs um, and the cars go by and honk and wave and thumbs up and, and all kinds of information comes in um, from the public in this way. And so we decided that um, we needed to establish um, a place where people could give information because some people want to give important information against um, these places, but they're afraid. You know, these are dangerous, convicted felon people, and not everybody wants to, you know, give information freely. So we actually established a, an email law, uh, account so that people can make anonymous tips. And so we have all kinds of people reporting all kinds of illegal activity um, on our on our um, email. And so we also came up with a, a slogan, and the slogan, the campaign became Be the Wall. And Be the Wall means to be the wall against drug abuse, misuse, and overdose by, you know, just being the wall. And, um, and so the great thing about the social networking is that um, through Facebook, you end up with so many different kinds of people with so many different talents that you would normally never find. Um, and so through the Facebook group, we had a carpenter come forth, and he built us a beautiful centerpiece um, that will be used as the centerpiece for our um, campaign, Be the Wall. And uh, we had um, people who came forth from churches that um, they weren't going to be protesters, but they could pray. 
And so we actually had what we called prayer warriors, and the prayer warriors um, came forth and with an idea that they called drive-by prayer. And um, some of you may not know what a drive-by prayer is, but it's very similar to a drive-by shooting, but bullets don't go out the window, prayers do. And so um, I thought that was just the novelist idea, and, and um, they took the lead in this, and uh, they actually had seven prayers um, and every day. They made up a map, they would drive by the pain clinics, and they would pray. Um, to br- and it has a symbolism like bringing down the walls of Jericho. And so, you know, we love our prayer warriors. And, um, and so you have to find a way to just exploit everybody's talent because everybody wants to do something. And, um, and so we've been really good at that. Another thing that we did do is we put, uh, we put, we made um, a memorial um, window in a department store right on Town Square. And in it is our Be the Wall campaign, and we also have pictures, um, photographs of um, our lost loved ones who have died from drug-related deaths. Many of them are children. And it stands there to this day, and it'll be there as long as uh, the mayor of the city allows us to keep it there. Um, and so it's a tribute, but also we get to use their faces to, to bring, you know, um, to put a picture on this and to show that, you know, it's affecting everybody. Um, And so that's been very successful. So, um, Lisa, I think that you've given us a lot uh, to work with there, and I don't want you to – they're going to have a lot of questions, I think, for you as well. So I want them to be able to come back and ask some more of your strategies. I think – I mean, I don't know how we're going to be prayer warriors, but that's that's, uh, (laughs) – we're off to a good start there. Um, uh, Kasserian and Gera or Kasparian and Gera, something like that, I think is that Maasai greeting we're talking about, Mm -hmm. which means how are the children – and uh, Dr. Deniaco is the perfect person to answer that question. She's been working with young people uh, for a long time in this prevention arena um, and created some great uh, programs and ideas. Uh, I'd like to ask you, then, what do, you, um, what do young people need to know about the problem? And also, what changes do we need to make in our schools? And to be fair, what are our schools doing well? I mean, I, I keep asking what changes, but I think another thing to ask is, what are we doing well that we want to keep doing? Um, I, too, would like to thank everyone uh, for the opportunity to be here. I am honored to be a part of this panel and certainly the opportunity to share with all of you. Um, When you think about the children and you think about the schools, oftentimes people come to the schools and ask, what are you going to do or what are you doing? And I love what I'm hearing here. It's really all of us working together. In isolation, we cannot continue to make a difference. And what the schools at least that I've had the opportunity to be a part of, is reaching out and working collectively together. One of the things that we know, at least when I think about prescription drug use, and I think about the history of where we've uh, come from and where we're headed, um, we cannot sit quietly. Um, When you take a look at the past and when we first um, think about underage drinking, and there was a time when we didn't talk about it uh, because we didn't know what to do. We cannot sit around and not talk about this. You said victims. We're talking about children. If we continue to sit and not talk about it, we are allowing young people to die, and we cannot do that. So we collectively have to have a voice and come together. Let me me ask this uh, along those lines. We talked about perception a little bit, and we've touched on prevention. Uh, You know, as a young young person, we were taught that there's good drugs and then there's bad drugs. Mm -hmm. Well... Now we're saying good drugs can go bad, right, is what we're hearing. So how do we go back and address that perception that that we created? That How how do we do it? And and I guess I would like to ask uh, Dr. Deniaco, would some of the strategies that we've used in the other arena, you know, the street drug arena, be effective? And would that contribute to what you're trying to do on the task force as far as instead of reinventing the wheel, let's go find what we've done that's been effective for years and years and years? That's an excellent question, and I think that's one that a lot of parents are worried about when they are actually taking their own prescribed medication, and their child says, wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that. That's bad for you. I think it's part of the educational process that we all have to work collectively together. Certainly, I think some of the strategies that we have in place from uh, the school system works. What we're talking about are people misusing medications, and so um, that's where that clear message comes in where if we have a parent who is misusing a prescription, what's the message that the young person's getting? We have to, so it starts, we can start early on from preschool and teach what is appropriate, what is not, why this is unsafe, 
what, what are the possible dangers, how this can affect us. And then as, as young people continue to get older and as we collectively work with our middle school and high school students, if we're, if we're aware of it, what are the strategies that we have in place? What education pieces can we give to our parents so that when they are worried, what can they work, uh, how can they effectively intervene? The earlier we intervene, the better things will uh, be for our young people. The same with high school and, of course, college. I think that um, we have to <coughs> not be in isolation, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are fortunate where I think that the, where we're headed with the understanding of the importance of coalitions, that message doesn't just come from one place. It just doesn't come from the teacher saying, Jessica, this is not okay. It's coming collectively so that we're hearing it from um, hopefully our doctors, hopefully our coaches, hopefully our parents, hopefully our administrators, our teachers, and collectively that message is, is very clear what's appropriate, what's not, and that medication is not okay unless your name is on that bottle. And I think uh, also a response to the same question is that we have, uh, when we look at our prevention initiatives in the past, we've said good drugs and bad drugs. Mm -hmm. And Associate Director George Meyer pointed to it when he says when law enforcement looks, mm -hmm. illegal, illicit right. are the bad drugs. And so we do have to go back and redefine, if you will, in our prevention strategies. And when we look at the direction that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association and that administration is going in, we are looking toward prevention-prepared communities, which means that we must always take into consideration what is the climate that the society is dealing with, going back and re-educating so that young people learn that the improper use of a prescribed drug is a bad thing. And so we do have to go back and pick up where we have left off so we don't stigmatize because many of our young people have to take prescription medication. And we don't want their peers saying, you're a bad person because you take this thing that's in a bottle. But it is the appropriate use of what has been brought about to help and to heal. And we do have to re-educate and start from ground zero again. You know, I think that's really an excellent point. More people are dying from legal prescriptive medication than they are from cocaine or heroin and some of the other things that we call bad drugs. Mm -hmm. And many individuals think because it's legal and it's a prescription, it is good. Mm -hmm. And we really have to emphasize the point that yes, it is legal, yes, it is a prescription. If it's not for you, then it's a bad thing. I think there's also another uh, key issue here, and that is there's often a fine line between good drug and bad drug. And so uh, we do some work in our, in our uh, initiative at Ohio State, and my good colleague Nicole Quick is really good at this. If, for example, we look at the structure, chemical structures of some products, if we look at the chemical structure of heroin and OxyContin, for example, and put them on a, in fact, we use these at bulletin boards in our work. Uh, I mean, they are, they are virtually, I mean, they are very similar products. We know that as health professionals, but the lay person does not know that. They are very similar drugs. And so, you know, there is a fine line here between them. And, and we say, you know, um, look, look at their chemical structures. They're more similar than you might think. You know, think of them as potentially harmful products. One of the things, uh, and that's an excellent point, as we began to see the trends through our Ohio Substance Abuse Monitoring Network, the increase in prescription drug abuse for non-medical purposes amongst adolescents. We began to also simultaneously see an increase in heroin use. And it's because of what the point that you just made. When you look at the cost of purchasing illegal prescription drugs on the street and the comparative cost of heroin, which has had similar chemical structure and results in the same high, if you will. Our fear of needles leaves quickly because, again, an individual who is involved in a compulsive activity trying to get to their drug of choice will switch drugs if it is still within that same category. And so what we often thought was we have this huge increase in heroin use in Ohio. We didn't take a step back and look 
how was that transition fueled? It was actually the increase in prescription drug abuse. And once you don't have access to that, you begin to look for other means of fulfilling that. When we talk about addiction, we know that it is a complex brain disease that results in seeking and craving behavior that won't even stop in the face of very, very negative consequences. That is why we have to balance that awareness and education to make sure there is treatment access so that when our loved ones, these aren't just Ohioans, these aren't just they and them, our consumers or clients, these are our family members who are caught up in the cycle of addiction and we have to have a means of helping them and assisting them because treatment does work and people do recover. And so we have to take a step back in order to take a step forward. You know, that <clears throat> your point about treatment is interesting. <clears throat> and there is a question here about treatment in terms of the state budget and where are we with that and what impact will the, will, we don't know yet, I know what will happen in the future, but in, in terms of where we are now and what's needed for treatment in our state, uh, any indication of where we might be going. There are some more questions on prevention here as well, but. And needless to say, that, that should be the question that is on all of our minds. Currently, state departments are preparing their budgets. Our budgets are being prepared based on the exact same amount that we had going forward. But we know that we are facing tough times. And it would be easy for us to say, we're going to submit the exact same budget. But the reality is that while those numbers will go in, we know that there is a backdrop of an economic crisis. All of us know that on a very personal level. We know that the treatment system has been impacted. There have been some tough decisions. It is very easy to lead during good times, but it takes strong leadership skills with a level of integrity and tenacity and a level of collaboration and cooperation across cabinet directors and across our entire treatment system to lead during tough times. We could not have predicted this. None of us would have predicted this rise in prescription drug abuse, but none of us are quitting. We are not backing down and we will not be still because when it's your child that is in need of treatment, you will do whatever you can to make it happen. And so we have tough decisions to make, but we will move forward committed to making sure that access is available. I think also from the budget perspective, uh, what we're looking at is partnerships and collaboration. We are looking at what federal resources are available, what mm -hmm. state resources are available, and what resources are available at the local level. And our whole awareness campaign and our village concept Absolutely. will allow all of us to come together to find out how we can work together to address this. Well, let me, let me ask. I mean, mm -hmm. often we think, well, what's the budget? So let's go plan what we're going to do. What, what's the money? And now we'll go do whatever. Uh, can I go back to Lisa, who had all these great ideas that your community implemented? Uh, I listened to them. They sound like great ideas. You guys seem to hear them, enjoy them, think they were great ideas. Did you put a lot of thought into, well, where's all this money going to come from, or did you begin action and, and, and regardless of the budget? Well, I'll tell you that um, we don't have any money, and so <laughs> um, everything so that, that we've done, everything that we've done has been pretty much free. Um, we did make some T-shirts, um, and we invested in some T-shirts, and we sell the T-shirts for ten dollars, which allows us to make a couple dollars a T-shirt. And so um, our group wears them, but they also, uh, the community buys them. And so we've raised a little bit of money. Um, but everything that we did pretty much was volunteerism and uh, didn't take a lot of money. And um, we've been really good at figuring out ways to, to have a, a major impact on a shoestring budget. And uh, I just think that's a lesson. I wanted to make that point as she was talking. Uh, believe me, I've been in a position where we could whine about uh, budgets. Uh, uh, and, but I think it's so important that the issues uh, relevant and we need to keep addressing it and we can't let the money thing give us an excuse to not uh, continue to fight. Hey, what's the cost of the prayer campaign? Just drive by. <laughs> <laughs> well with the gas prices now, you don't even mind. I don't know. Let's not go there. I, I had us going on a good track there, Director Jackson. You brought us right back. Uh, all right. Uh, Diane, you got another question? We do have another question. This is from someone who's worked in uh, 
solid waste management in the past, actually, and she she's talked about disposing of various types of things, knows that disposal days are expensive, another cost issue here, although I've seen them done for nothing here, too, and our short-term fixes, but uh, what effects, uh, what efforts are being made on a statewide level to take medication disposed, to make it more sustainable, more regular, um, allow pharmacists to take back medications? Well, I think I can speak a little bit on the disposal days because they are um, uh, somewhat labor intensive and they do involve law enforcement. Uh, currently under the structure with the DEA, law enforcement needs to be involved in a take back program. Uh, they actually have to get a permit to properly uh, take back the uh, prescription drugs. And that's, you know, I want to back up just a little bit from that and we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, um, good drugs, bad drugs. Mm -hmm. and you know. These uh, drugs that we're talking about, you know, these the pain-killing drugs that people often use after some type of surgery or some type of event, and then they have a few pills left over, and it's always the mindset, and I think I'm going to keep bringing this up because it's the mindset that we really need to change in folks. It's the mindset about good drugs, bad drugs, and it's the mindset about you have these few pills left up in the bottle, and so I think a lot of us think, well, we'll just put them in the drawer for next time. And so we talk about, and, and um, we'll talk a little bit about the take backs. And so th these take backs are, are certainly um, labor intensive. And I think we're getting some movement on, on the federal level. There's been some changes, and uh, Director Dawson can talk a little bit about some of the uh, positive changes we're starting to see on the federal level to make it a little easier for us to do that and to, to be involved in these take back programs. And I think they can be very effective um, in our state. And I know. Uh, Director Dawson and her staff have taken the lead in, in helping uh, identify take back programs across the state and participate in, sta in these types of programs. Uh, can I ask Jessica, we talked mm -hmm. about the state and what they can do. Uh, do you have any tips for us on, in our own houses, in, in our grandparents' houses, in our parents' mm -hmm. houses? Uh, what, what can we be teaching them? What can we be teaching our children? What can we do just to make sure that we're doing our part on an individual level to, to prevent? Well, I would say that uh, it's very common for people that are drug seeking to take medications from someone's house, go into the bathroom, open the medicine cabinets. Um, you know, somebody that's addicted to painkillers, for example, that's, you know, anywhere they go, they're going to open that medicine cabinet when they go into someone's bathroom, relative or not, um, because they're constantly on the search for that craving, um, you know, as was discussed earlier. And so they're constantly on the search. So that, that medication is probably going to be stolen if it's just in the bathroom cabinet. So I would say that if you're, you know, we just talked about disposing of prescription drugs. If you're not taking any longer, get rid of it. And if you are still taking it, keep it with you. Don't keep it somewhere out in the open or in a medicine cabinet. Yeah. Well, when my children were growing up, we kept our alcohol locked away, but we didn't think about keeping our prescription drugs locked away. It's just a marketing campaign. The state of New Jersey has done a wonderful job of this. They have actually have an award-winning campaign, campaign called Grandma's Stash. It's the, the fact that grandma does, has a stash and she may not <coughs> understand it. And so it's, it's, it's a matter of public awareness, really. And when we talk about the opportunities for drug take-back programs, you know, ONDCP at the national level has certainly initiated many strategies and policies that are going to help make it easier uh, to have drug take-backs across this state, both uh, this year as well as last year. There were numerous drug take-back programs. The Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force will be participating with Ashland County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board on September 25th and their drug take-back program. That is the DEA's National Drug Take-Back Program. As you stated, uh, New Jersey has their campaign who knew grandma had to stash? And if we think about grandma, we know grandma's pill box is right there on the dining room table. And we know that that is where the pills are. And if we know that visually in our head, our young people know that. And so we really have to be diligent about what we can do. We've done it before. We've locked away our guns. We've locked away our liquor. And again, we have the capacity to monitor our medications and lock those away so that they are not unintentionally diverted. I just want to speak again about some of the efforts that we are doing through the Ohio Department of Health. And I talked a little bit about our prevention campaign, which was focused on the <coughs> urban 
in urban county, Cuyahoga, and rural counties, Benton, Ross, Adams, and Jackson. And as part of those counties, there will be drug drop-off campaigns there, and there will also be many, many other type of education programs. And so I just want you to know from a state perspective, we are doing lots of work in the local community to address a number of these issues. And, and if uh, for pharmacists to be able to take back medication would take a, take a change in state law to have that happen? Is that a policy change, I believe? Yeah. Or is that... I think it's going to take a change in federal regulations. Federal. I know there's some things that are out there at this point. There was a follow-up question that yes. came from there's that as well. There's been some discussion about that, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, there was a question about uh, what what is everyone doing to reach people who do not speak English, people who are Hispanic, deaf, Somalian? I think as with all of our uh, services, we have to be sensitive that uh, the portrait of Ohio has to reflect those individuals who live and, and work with us and share with us. In that, we also have to be cognizant that any campaign that we do has to reach all Ohioans, all family members. And so we have to be diligent and specifically look to those communities to assist us in providing the level of translation that is needed and coming to that community from a culturally competent and appropriate perspective when we talk about the issue of drugs so that we can get the message that we intend to get across to those communities. This program is made possible by Cardinal Health and is a co-production of the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and WOSU Public Media.